Bible, and we'll read, let's read, um, anyway, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Okay, the lesson is called to be holy, um, and it is uh, 1 Peter uh, 15, but as he which is called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And I want to jump to um, the last verse, 25, and it says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. That's just a partial quote from Isaiah. So he is taken... And here he says that we are to be holy, for I am holy. That's almost to our flesh, we would say that this is just a, almost an oxymoron. If you're in the flesh, you say, man, God just lays it out. If you read much in the Old Testament, um, and God tells us now, because there is as much put on in the New Testament on holiness as there was in the Old Testament. And God just tells us plain by the apostle, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you think there's not much a struggle with that, you can turn to the apostle Paul and his writings. But here's one thing. God would never command something of us that he didn't give us the ability to do. So here again, he just, he just lays it out. He tells us that this is what we must do. And so today's lesson deals with just simply holiness. And it's something that God calls for us to do and we must do it. Now, the beginning of this lesson, you may remember, I don't know how long it's been, I didn't look it up, but um, I talked about the Hubble telescope. So um, you won't believe how excited I was. <laughs> don't make fun of me <laughs> okay I'm joking um, when I looked at the beginning of this lesson and this is what they talked about but I am serious um, they do make um, some valid points in this some I told my wife I just wish I would have thought of this because there is some valid points in this but it was the launch it was launched in 1990 and truly this, um, it was short of nothing of, um, revolutionary. It has offered stunning images of, the, of our universe in its decades of operation. It has recorded 1, 1.5 million observations, including locations that are 13.4 billion light years from Earth. Analysis of those observations has resulted in over 19,000 public scientific papers. Those are from NASA. Now, Hubble, its mission came within literally a hair's breadth of failing. Shortly after its launch, it began sending back its first images, and obviously there was a flaw in the telescope. It was known as a spherical aberration in which 
the telescope and what had happened is when the light that was going to be focused, um, the light fell. It, the light came in and what it done, the two mirrors focused the light on the same point. And that's where it failed. And really, that is truly, um, in doing so, it could only operate at a, a fraction of its true potential. Because here it is, it's offering so much. And I thought, man, when it comes to our spiritualness, what is God? He is the light. We are to reflect God's holiness. And here is Hubble. It can't reflect the light that it was designed to do because there was a flaw developed in it. And so the image that it was supposed to portray, it was flawed. It was not, they was not getting the true quality of what they were supposed to get. But it could not, and what it was doing, it was, um, it was operating without the distortion that, that it could get here on earth. However, but they had to figure out something to do. And so what they really tried to do was upgrade of Hubble's camera with just optical adjustments that compensated for the flaw in the mirror. Taking that design, you know, they literally... Let's just make a pair of glasses for it. Really is as absurd as that sounds. That's really what they had to do and create a pair of glasses for this. The challenge was to find a way to get this to be able to lift it off and get it up there to it and do it. It's really amazing that they could even do it. So once they did that, um, it's 30th birthday in 2020 success. They come back. They seen the images that it was supposed to do, and then in uh, one giant red nebula, uh, NCG 2014, and its neighbor and smaller, the blue one, was 163,000 light years away. Now, here is the true story in it. The real, and I've said this is amazing to me. What the flaw was, was one fiftieth the size of a human hair. So, I mean, that was a flaw you couldn't see. You couldn't even probably see that with a telescope. How could you even detect that? They, you know, I've watched um, because, you know, I even wrote down in my notes, joking, they're just going to be on the edge of their seat when I'm talking about this. So... Um, the scientist was saying, there is no way to detect this. One fiftieth the size of a human hair, how could we know this? It's when it started sending back the images that we knew something was wrong. And I'm talking about reflecting God's holiness. So here it is, and the truth come out, that it was, it was literally an invisible flaw that had devastating visible consequences. And that's what happens when somebody says, I can't be holy. Really? We should never say that. We should never even imply that. Because God just simply said, be ye holy, for I am holy. And God makes a way. So... And really and truly, when you think about it, you know, and here's the thing that really humbles me. Holiness is the very thing that separated humanity from God. And then God says, be ye holy for I am holy. You talk about grace and just how much grace has allowed us to get close to the Lord. When holiness was the very thing. I mean, when you go to Leviticus and you read in Leviticus just how strict God was about his temple and about all the statutes and everything they had to go through, just read about the Day of Atonement, all the laws that had to be held and up and just carried through. I mean, 
you know, it, it, it's just like the guy was joking about, uh, I, I was listening to a minister and he was making a joke about electricity. He says, um, that's why I don't mess with electricity because I, what I know I've messed up, I'm looking Jesus in the face because you don't get a second chance. So, you know, it, it was that way with, with a holiness in the Old Testament because you did not violate holiness. And it, it just was not to be done. And then, so here we have this one-fiftieth of a human hair and it come back and it was this invisible flaw that just crushed NASA and it was just so people that try to make fun of holiness one day this invisible flaw is going to have a devastating visible consequence because God would not tell us to do so I'm going to repeat myself that he would not give us the ability to do, pure and simple. So where our um, lesson came from was from the Apostle Peter. And some people think, or even is this the Apostle Peter, uh, since it is short, it is just not even the writings of Paul. You know, Paul wrote so much. In the New Testament, they even look at it almost like the Apostle Peter. Uh, it's just his is so short, his must be of less value. Now, that is totally wrong. It is not right. But these letters that the Apostle uh, Peter wrote, they are of immense value. He played a critical role within the 12. Uh, it's very important, church. In severe cases, you know, the people face government opposition such as imprisonment and banishment, the New Testament church, his message was remarkable, relevant to us where we must navigate in this world, but not of this world. He was telling them. And then in 1 Peter, let's read. Um, I don't know if I gave him this verse, but 1 Peter um, 3, 15. It says, um, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be uh, ready always to give an answer to every man that asked if you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. He just said, just be ready. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And then he says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asked a reason of the hope. It says, be ready. That don't mean when somebody asks you, think of an answer. That means be ready ahead of time. Not that you have to just go out and just brainstorm. No. That's where the anointing of God comes in. I mean, if somebody asks you a, a, a question that's truly off the wall, if it deems an answer and you don't have the answer, that's where we have to lean on the Holy Ghost. And God said he would fill our mouth if it's truly an answer that needs to be answered that we can have it. But it was, it was something that we are in, but not of this world. But for Peter, salvation was not only a past experience, but it was a future hope. It was not something that just happened one time. It is a day-to-day -day walk and experience with the Lord. It was an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. He also told us to gird up the loins of your mind. The imagery here is important. It is not speaking of, of just, it's speaking of the garments that they wore, this sleeveless tunic, long. I know you've heard this, but he's telling them, literally gird that up, take that, tuck it in. In other words, if you was walking I hate to say it this way, but if you was walking in what we would deem a dress and you would need to move, you would have to tuck that in, that which would hinder you. In other words, you would need to move fast. So what he was saying, gird up the loins of your mind, whatever is hindering you, you've got to get rid of it. Because he is taking that to their garment. If you are working with something, 
and it's being a hindrance to you, would you keep on working with it? And he is making that spiritually wise now. And if something is, is you know, if you're coming to church and it's just like, and if something is truly, truly spiritually bothering you, do you go on and just let it torment you? Obviously not. You would want to, that's where he says, gird up the loins of your mind. Because you're just playing with fire if you just let that continually, continually bother you. So he tells them to gird up the loins of their mind. And we must live and look for the, the coming anticipation of the Lord. Now, he said, this will help us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You know, I've, I've heard here a while back that the number one topic in the New Testament is salvation. The number two topic is the coming of the Lord. God is coming to get his people. Number one is get your flesh ready. And number two is God is coming to get those that have their flesh ready. He's coming to get his church. In rejecting the former things, having this mindset, rejecting that, Peter called our former lust such captivity that unbridled desire to have the essence of the pagan lifestyle. Paul was talking to him. He provided a lengthy um, thing. He, t- he just finally, as Paul spoke, be not conformed to this world. Their patterns of actions control not by the fixing their eyes and, and they was, um, but he said, not on a desire, literally, not on just what you see. You, it's not about your desire. It's about this world is not our home. This is not our home. The path that leads to the coming salvation was introduced. It was not, it was marked by opposition to worldly values and their understanding. Peter expected the hearers to make a full break with their former identities. He used the rebirth language to describe this. And it says, we have been gotten again into a lively hope. This new identity is not a product, but it's of our own imagination. Um, It's not a product of our own imagination, but it's of divine action. It's not something that we dream, not something that we want. It's something that God gives us he anoints us and then this i will pursue what i can and god said that hit this new identity it's been given by god we are to be children of obedience and then we are to do this and then so he he takes and he does this Throughout scripture, obedience to divine commands is the essence of humanity's proper relationship with God. It is an expression of both loyalty and faith. It is an obligation that we owe to God as both creator and Lord. It is the only way for humans to access divine blessings and protections. In relationship with God, first of all, all children should be children of obedience. It is simply, obedience is not simply a matter of obligation or an optimal way to guarantee success in our endeavors. Before all of that, obedience is the loving response of grateful children as of a loving father that the Lord is. The Bible says, as a father pitieth his children, so doth the Lord pity them, pitieth them that fear him. This imagery is as call to obedience softens the break that we must make with our former life. God does not call us to leave our old life without simultaneously open the door to welcome us into the warmth and safety of our family. Demands for obedience are more than matched by offers of care and protection. As he, as he is holy, reflecting God's holiness... The Bible says, as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all conversation, because it is written, be ye holy. At first glimpse, God's call us to be holy is what we ought not to do. But holiness is more about what we ought to do instead of conforming to the former lust. We are called to be holy in all manner of conversation. 
in every aspect of life. Peter pointed out that this conversation is rooted in the Old Testament, echoed in the direct uh, citing of Leviticus 19.2. The, the book of Leviticus features chapters 17 through 26, which we have dubbed, which many have dubbed the Holiness Code. This group of chapters form the, the book that are the teachings of the central heart of the Mosaic law. As we know, Jesus understood his teaching not as an overturning of the law, but at the truest fulfilling, because he said he came to fulfill the law. Now, in this Leviticus 17 through uh, 26, Jesus said, or I'll just give you some snippets of it, 17 in Leviticus, it is about bring, bringing offerings to the tabernacle, Israel forbidden to eat blood, chapter 18. Israel is to keep God's ordinances, the sin of incest, immoral acts forbidden, Israel not to be defiled, chapter 19. Laws concerning personal conduct, uh, be righteous in dealings, keeping strains Pure, various laws, treat strangers kindly. Verse 20, penalties for sinning, keep God's statutes, penalties for law breaking, to follow the Lord. Chapter 21, laws regarding priest, holiness of priest without blemish. Uh, 22, priest to be pure, eating of priest food, offering without blemish, uh, sacrifice of thanksgiving. 23, Feast of the Lord, Sabbath, the Passover, the first fruits, Pentecost, the blowing of trumpets, the day of Pentecost, um, 24, oil for lamps, offering for the showbread, the penalty for blasphemy, equal administering of the law, and 25, the Sabbath, year of rest, 50, year of jubilee, the land to yield her fruit, Redemption of the land, of the poor, the hired servants. In chapter 26, reward for obeying the commandments, the punishments for disobedience. The land shall not yield, abandoned for disobedience. And the end of 26 is God will remember his covenant. So Leviticus has got a lot to say about what God wants to do and treat how his people should be. So, but he cites this, a lot of this, and there are separate arenas, the right worship, godly neighbor re uh, re uh, relations, care for the needy, prompt payment of wages are presented in all interconnected matters held together under the umbrella of the call to holiness. All of life, not just our worship, is meant to be covered Governed, excuse me, by God direct us. So it's not just, as someone would say, all you want to do, all that concerns you is holiness. No, holiness should affect every area of our life. That's not us, and that's not the way we interpret the Bible. That's the way the Bible interprets us. So it's not just us saying this. It is the way the Bible interprets God's holiness in our own personal lives, the, the, the children are to have their parents. Holiness then is a family resemblance. We are to share like their, their, their Savior. In other words, just like Adam and Eve, we are to bear, to bear a divine image. In other words, we are to have, like God told us to be holy, and Adam and Eve look like God, then we are to look like what the Bible says we are to look like as far as Christians. Then, for as much as ye know you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without uh, spot. Now, the fearsome wonder of God saving work in Jesus Christ, the fatherhood of God, used above to comfort and encourage. Now, the privileges of God, beloved child, entails an awesome responsibility bearing a likeness 
in a God-honoring lifestyle. This fear is not in the context of fright. Instead, it is a constant knowledge the child of God has that whatever he or she likes to think about to do to the scrutiny of God's penetrating love and holiness. It is a sense of responsibility that is born out of faith. Now, hope gifted to us by the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Now, we can take what is the holy character of God to look like. Is there any objected visible imagery or measure? Yes, it is our unfeigned love of the brethren that we are all children of God, of God implies not only that there is a unique relationship with our Heavenly Father, but also a unique relationship one with another. We are more than just friends and companions, um, colleagues or co-workers. We are brothers and sisters. This unique type of love in its own special term is in the New uh, Testament as the term Philadelphia. Now, we can take and we can believe this um, as we express this love from a pure, uh, fervent heart, a term often associated with prayer. Fervent in this context indicates that it is required for this type of love. It is hard work. Here, Peter linked back to his opening that we must gird up our minds like this work which we must prepare ourselves. This logic in 1 Peter 1 is is convincing and compelling. God who has abundant mercy has expressed his character in the glorious work of our redemption with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He has, whereby we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Word that, gen, word that generated life in Genesis 1 now spiritually regenerates fallen humanity. By it, we are delivered from the corruptive and uh, corrupted system of this world into the glorious life and incorruptible hope by the reality of the eternal in, um, hope. Now, we are to love God has given us as we have been loved, God has given us that. Now, we have this. First Peter said that we are proclaimed, that we have been called to reflect God's holiness. It is a, a flaw smaller than the human hair that almost destroyed the Hubble's effectiveness. What damage do our spiritual flaws do when we witness for Jesus Christ? Have we been reminded that the only Jesus that some non-believers will ever see is us? How do we represent him? Now, tiny little flaws that seem like they wouldn't matter. I wonder if they do really matter. Peter was clear on this point. We are called to be holy in all manner of conversation. Driving habits, eating habits, conversation, clothes, choices, entertainment choices, they all fall within the domain of this call to be holy. Those who wish to, re to reduce holiness to a list of rules should be warned. That list will be endless. Holiness encompasses every choice of life. And that is why if you tried to name it all, it would be endless. Because holiness to a true child of God takes up everything. So he wrote, but as he which is called you is holy, so be ye holy. His emphasis was not on the plan, was not on the demand placed upon the provision, but it's not as much on the provision given to us. It was to reflect. As we call on the Father, the grace upon the gospel, the gospel fixes on our flaws and our distortions. Now, the Bible does that. We have been provided a new life in Christ and 
we are actively being transformed by the Holy Ghost to be more like Him. Each day, it is God's love. And now, I want to I wanna end with this. In the Bible, in Genesis 3.8, you don't have to turn there if, if you don't want. Um, in the Old Testament, God just told them, be, be holy, you know, for I am holy. In the New Testament, we have been commanded this. But one thing amazing to me, when you take the story of Adam and Eve, you go down and you read in the third chapter of just how devastating it really was and it went. I don't, you know, I don't really know how, I wish I had more answers to this, but the Bible gives these here and that's just enough. I don't really know where Adam was when she was having the conversation with the serpent. I don't really know. But all I do know is in verse 8, after the sin had happened, they had transgressed, everything had went wrong. But the Bible says, and they heard the voice of the Lord, the Lord God, and they heard. So if you've ever wanted to know about grace, here is two people that had just committed the most gross sin ever possible. But they still had the ability to hear God. Now, it's been said when some people comes in and God touches them, they may even receive the Holy Ghost. Does God still have the ability to touch them? I'm telling you. I would never put my mouth on that. Not at all. All I'm saying is here, but the answer I say to that is yes. But here's what I'm saying in the New Testament, we have the veil that's writ from top to bottom. We have grace. God said, be holy for I am holy. He would not give us a command that we couldn't fulfill. So when it all went wrong and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and what do they do? They hide themselves. So if God would take them and still give them the ability to hear his voice after what they had done, that's a merciful God. That is a truly merciful God. So when he tells us, be ye holy for I am holy, all you got to do is just ask God, let me hear you. Help me. Let me get over this. Help me to be the man or woman that I need to be. And God in his strength and in his mercy, he will do that. He will do that. Hallelujah. Let's stand. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for what your word says. You are truth, you are light, and I thank you for it, holy God. I love you this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for it is truth. And I thank you this day that you are the one, Lord God, that is able to see us each and our hour of the day. Touch us this day, God, I pray. Strengthen each and every one of us. Be with us. Touch us, anoint us, Lord God. We thank you for this word, for it is eternal, Lord God. Thank you for what you're going to do in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Jesus.